Uh, good evening. Is everybody in? Shall I begin? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to be speaking in English. I hope it's not a problem. I will try and speak slowly. Um, and hopefully, if you have any questions um, for clarification, we can correct that at the end. Um, let me begin by saying thank you very much for um, inviting me here. Um, I don't know where Mirko is um, and Gaia, who have been amazing in setting this up. And thank you especially to uh, Lorenza and Marco um, for making the contact and for making all of this possible. I feel very happy to be here. And thank you also to Alice from Gallery Continua, who has come to support me and who has arranged to loan the, the, the foiled works on the wall and the, uh, the, the, the neon crucifix. Um, so without further much ado, let me begin. It's a long journey tonight, and um, if I see you getting bored, I'll fast forward and skip a few. Um, and if you're excited, then we can continue. But essentially what I'd like to do tonight is something I've never done before, which is I'm going to try to talk about the, at best I can call it the archaeology of symbolism. Because what we're going to do is we're going to try and excavate through layers of meaning to try to understand how it is that we come to think and believe certain things that we do. And in the process, I'm going to propose another way of thinking about the role that an artist can play in society today, because I think this is a very, very important moment in the history of the planet, in the history of our species, in the, in the history of cultures as we understand them today, that we've reached a very vital point where I think it's necessary to shift the understanding of what art can be and what an artist is supposed to be. So, the intoxication of being candle gears. Let's begin at the very beginning. So, in the very beginning was bang. I mean, whether one believes in ideas of creation or whether one believes in the Big Bang or whatever, somehow we came into the world a spark of consciousness. We came into our bodies, into our beings, with an understanding, a perception, raw, vital, here I am, I exist. And we needed to try to make sense of what it is that we are, what it is that we could be, what it is that makes us human, think and feel and perceive the way we do. So the first thing we do is we take a look around us. We notice the world has a horizon. We start to think about our place in relation to where we're living. So we draw from the dot, which was the beginning of consciousness, we draw a line, which is, okay, now I'm in the world. I see the horizon, I see the land, I see the fields, I see my place in this world. But then we need something more, because we don't make any sense by just seeing the land, so we add the vertical. We look up to the heavens in search of divinity. We look up to the heavens in search of something divine, in search of our gods. We look up to the heaven to search for a meaning, for a spiritual meaning, which makes sense of our place over here. And over the years, I mean, so I'm going to be, what I'm going to be doing here is, I'm not going to be essentially speaking about my work but I'm going to be dropping in my work every now and then to try to help you understand why over the years I've made certain things. So this is a work of mine which is in the Pompidou collection, um, which is a, it, it's a crucifix which has been wrapped in red and white chevron danger tape, which I hope by the end of the lecture you'll understand why. But this, this idea of the vertical, and the, hor on the, the vertical and the horizontal, it's not only about Christianity, it's in every culture around the world. This idea of making sense of our world, in search of something divine. So here we see people from Africa essentially taking the same logic and, and uh, dancing with it. Here we see an image from the, one of the very first books that was ever written, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And what you actually see playing out in this vertical on the horizon is um, the soul being weighed at the end of the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead tells the story that when you die, your heart is taken, put onto a scale, and weighed against a feather. And of course, the Egyptians had the ank. Um, the symbol t to define their idea of the, the, the question of spirituality. 
Now, once we've got sorted out our idea of, okay, so here we live in the world, and here we have our idea of divinity, we start to want to focus. We want to start to say, this is mine. This is my land. So we start to create the idea of my property, my house. We start to create the idea of, so here's another work of mine called A Rose by Any Other Name. Um, we start to protect our land with this idea of private space. And of course, it's not enough just to have your house and your home and your farm. You want more than just your private space. So we double up that circle and we start to say, well, this is my country. This is my faith. And so we start to invent the ideas of borders and countries and territories. And of course, we end up creating military machines like NATO, which say this part of the world is ours and that part of the world is not. So we create this idea of us and them. So we start with the spark of consciousness. And very simply, by a few lines, I've described the terrible history of the circumstance that's brought us to the present. But it's not just the idea of faith or borders that we use to control ourselves. We want to go one step further, and we start to try to invent the idea of the planet, north, south, east, west. We start to try to invent, we try to take the space of nature and divide it up into latitudes and longitudes and try to invent the idea of place in the world, place that can be defended, place that can be defined, very rational ways of trying to, like a cake, slice up something that probably shouldn't be sliced up. And then we go one step further, and once we've got our territories, well, then we have to make it even more complex and introduce currencies and start to introduce um, trademarks and start to invent other further ways of taking that spark of consciousness, taking that idea of the divine and breaking it down into something much more profitable. Um, and then, of course, we invent the concept of time. We invent time zones simply in order to enslave ourselves in traffic jams. We invent time in order to try to be late to try and go somewhere in chase of the, you know, the wonderful um, big dollar or euro, whatever you want to call it. And we become prisoners of our own perception. We become prisoners of materialism. We become prisoners locked into consuming the planet that we're living in. And this is where I start to say we need to try to find other ways of seeing. So here's another work of mine, and I'm adding the title for this one because it's very important. Pray, play, pray, and pay. We start to invent ways of dealing with the world that we're living in, whether it be the idea of prayer, our connection with the divine, whether it be the idea of playing, the idea of joy, or the idea of de eating, devouring, pray the, with, with the E. This is the, you know, when the lion devours the lamb. This is the... And paying, of course, you know, we go back to the previous image, you know, the, the idea of commercialism. And, of course, the, my, the bronze that was my hands was obviously based on, on Dura. And we start to then try to take this world that we're living in and we introduce mathematics. We start to introduce abstract thought. We try to take something very simple and very basic and try to t transform it into something rational, scientific, logical, I mean, I always love this particular image because this is one of the earliest representations of a human being from the caves of Lascaux. And I will come back to this image again and again and again. But what, wh why I chose this image for the, the Pythagoras um, triangle is, so you see this guy lying there with his little erection, which I find very fascinating. This is the only image in the caves of Lascaux which is humanoid. Every other image in the Lascaux caves 19,000 years ago were animals. And it's this idea of, well, so we take this impulse and we try to define it, we try to rationalize it, we try to mathematize it. Not unlike what Dura is doing here when he's, um, this is his perspective machine. So he's looking through the grid at the woman with her, looking between her legs and he's creating this grid, which of course is introducing the idea of play, but essentially, so there's the beautiful image of chess, but he's starting to construct this idea of rationalizing things which cannot be rationalized. The guy in Lascar with his erection or the, the artist Dura looking between the, the legs of the lady, trying to rationalize very intense psychological processes, that are r electrical charges that are rushing through the body to try to make sense of um, in a different way than, than one would be playing chess, but the same kind of complexity. And I introduce this because the, the black and white square becomes very important, very key 
in how my story is going to play out here. Because so I chose this image, um, which is actually from Rennes Le Chateau. I mean, if you've ever heard anything about the Da Vinci Code, so it all plays out in this particular um, church in the south of France called Rennes Le Chateau. Um, and I just needed an image to show the black and white squares. It's very common in a lot of chapels and churches and even cathedrals to have black and white squares. So here we see a representation of um, the, the, the um, Temple of Solomon, which we also see playing out here in the Marcel Duchamp et Tandonnet, which you don't see. If you look through the, 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 the little hole, the peephole, um, on the floor you have the black and white squares, which of course are also in every Freemason temple. And what they are is they're the Western, the European idea which plays out in Eastern consciousness in the yin and yang. This idea that nothing is essentially black or white. That in the black you have the white, in the white you have the black. So from the Freemason point of view or from the, from the Christian point of view, it's this idea of um, that light and dark are dependent on each other. And so it's put down on the floor as a reminder to us that in every good person, you have something bad. In every bad person, you have something good. You have creation and destruction simultaneously in every single person. And these things cannot be denied because if you try to imagine us as one-dimensional people, only black or only white, you're going to get the whole equation wrong. And of course, this is the image um, I use of myself, um, painting my face in black and white. Somebody once said, do you make a lot of black and white drawings? So here we, um, we have the, the black and white mural that I made specifically for this, um, this place here in black and white. Somebody said, did you long ago, do I make works in black and white because I come from South Africa? Well, no, but yes. I mean, indeed, coming from South Africa, and I will, through the course of this talk, allude to my experiences of having grown up in South Africa. But yes, I use black and white very much for this idea of, for, on a symbolic level, going back to the yin and yang, that the coexistence of contradictory forces is what makes an artist. Um, and here we have an alchemical image of the androgen, um, and you'll see they're doing very different things. This idea of the simultaneous creation and destruction, male and female, positive and negative, creative and destructive, simultaneously, not in balance, it's simultaneous forces coexisting. Now, of course, our ancestors wanted to make better sense of the world they're living in. So when they looked up to the sky, they started to map out the stars. They started to realize that in the constellations, you have these various planets that are playing out and seem to have a relationship between us, that people who are born in the sign of Gemini tend to have certain kinds of personalities. People born in the sign of Leo have other kinds of personalities. And so they start to try to make sense by looking into the sky of what's actually happening on the earth. Um, and I'm going to make quick departure here from the, the main story to say this, you know, the, I'm sure you've all heard the story from Ezekiel um, and the book of Revelations about the four cherubs, um, which, which can you the four cherubs that are in the biblical story. So you have the the, um, the, the, the eagle, the human, the lion, and the, um, the, 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 the bull. Now, I don't know if you know what's interesting when you look up at the sky, that these four signs actually make the four signs of Aquarius, Taurus, Scorpio, and um, what's the other one? It's the lion, the eagle, Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio, which introduces where I want to go tonight. Um, and of course, coming to Siena, I feel a great honor to be able to be speaking in Siena about Hermes Trimagustus, who has been a very big part of my life for many, many years. And for, I'm sure you all know, but when you walk into the Duomo, the first mosaic that you see on the floor is this image of Hermes Trimagistus. And what Hermes Trimagistus gave us is the emerald uh, tablet, which basically says, in, amongst other things, as above, so below. Now, this is the alchemical motto that I'm trying to talk about tonight, and that, for me, is the guiding light about how to try to make sense of being an artist, taking these ideas of symbolism that I'm trying to um, play out for you, and try to see how we can move forward. Now, 
one of them, the, so as above below, plays out in this, this Latin motto, um, which I won't dare to say to Italians, but um, essentially you can read translates as, um, visit the interior earth to find the hidden stone, to rectify the hidden stone. Now what's important about the, the alchemical mantra is that the difference between the alchemist and the scientist is that the scientist would step outside of the experiment. And the scientist would be cold and rational with their square lines, <laughs> left and right, whereas the alchemist implicates themselves. Because what the alchemist understood is that what they think and feel in their body, in their mind, has an effect on the world, and vice versa. So here you see from the, the Rider Waite tarot cards, the magician pointing up and pointing down, which is the embodiment of the, ma the mantra, as above, so below. But for me, born into South Africa, it has another meaning because I was born in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, if you remember when I said we invented this idea of North, South, East, and West, it always fascinates me why North is on the top because when you have a circle in space, what's the top and what's the bottom? You can't define the top and the bottom. It's the people who made the maps who decided the North is on the top because they were European. If the people who were making the maps were from the southern hemisphere, the world would look like this. Even the moon has a different face in the southern hemisphere than on the northern hemisphere. So it's about perception. How we perceive the world is very often determined by the world that we were born into and the circumstances of what we taught is top and bottom, right and wrong. Um, I spoke earlier about the idea of time, so here is a work of art I made which I showed um, in the north of Italy in the beginning. Um, and this is installed in Hagia Sophia in Istanbul called Present Tense. And it's actually a clock upside down, so a lot of people think it says the word hell, but actually it's just spelling out the time 11.34. And one minute later it'll say cell because that's 11.35. And the rest of the time it just doesn't make any sense. But So the world that you're born into determines how you see the world that you're in. Now one of the things I did a couple of years ago is I got very frustrated with my understanding of art, my understanding of the way the world is, and my understanding of what's going on, and I needed something more. I needed a deeper consciousness. I needed to find my Hermes Trimagistus to be able to go in and find my hidden stone that I could then rectify and correct. And I in my frustration, I turned to try to understand what is conceptual art, because apparently I'm a conceptual artist. And I looked at the manifesto of Saul Lewitt from 1969, and he said many things in his manifesto. But the and I will come to a few of them in a minute. But the 24th definition of a conceptual artist is perception is subjective. Now this becomes very important because we go back to the scientists. So here we have another image of you know, a world with squares and lines being folded. But what I'm using this to illustrate is the representation in quantum physics, that the quantum physicists, the conundrum of quantum physics is that when you divide up below the molecular level, when you get down to the, the smallest things that make up the universe, they can be either waves or particles. Now the thing is, something can't be standing still and moving at the same time. That's impossible. But what happens is that the quantum physicists have reached this understanding that if they decide to prove that it's a wave and it's moving, they will prove that it's a wave and it's moving. If the same scientist now sets out in the same laboratory to prove that it's a particle, they will prove it's a particle. And the only thing that changes is their perception. The only thing that changes the results of the experiment is the scientist has changed their desire of what they want to search for. Now this is impossible. Um, there's some seats over here if you want to. Right, all right. Now, this is old school quantum physics. New school quantum physics is even more scary because not only is it a wave and a particle at the same time, but these waves and particles are simultaneously here and in Johannesburg and on the moon in the past and the present and the future. So perception really is subjective, which takes us all the way back to um, Plato who who had this idea. I mean, the, I'm sure you've heard the very famous idea of Plato's um, um, cave. 
but he also had the, the same concept he used to talk about the line, which is the, uh, the division between what we perceive and what we know. The division between, but essentially making the same point of the quantum physicists and this idea of um, how perception changes the world, which is something that Goethe was talking about um, in his, his, his writings on color and his writings on nature. That so Goethe was proposing that the perception of the scientist is part of the result of the experiment. That's very important to take into account what the scientist is trying to see, what the scientist is trying to perceive, and that, especially in terms of nature, Goethe's writings on plants and, 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 and vegetables and, and um, vegetation, that he has to take into account the participation of the scientists. So, as a very interesting um, illustration of how perception is subjective. So you'll see in the mural here, I have, um, I've chosen Nkosi and Kisi figures from the Congo. Um, and there you see an image of the w one of them in the Congo. Now, the important thing about understanding African art, so when I said earlier, I, I had to rethink my concepts of a lot of things. And one of the things I try to address is having been, my family has lived in Africa for 300 years, but many people still don't think of me as an African because of the color of my skin. So I wanted to try to address and understand what is African art? How does African art differ from European art? Now the difference is this. So imagine this particular mask that you see there was made in the middle of the Congo in a jungle. And at the same time, the person who made it made a second one. And they are both absolutely identical. You cannot tell the difference between the two masks. You take the one mask and you put it into a vitrine in the museum immediately. The second mask is then danced and used. Now the first thing in order for it to be danced and used is it has to be animated. It has to be brought to life. This would traditionally be done with either milk or sperm or blood or any number of liquids or any number of ways of taking this object and transforming it from an object into an animated object. And when you put the mask on and you start dancing, what's going to happen is that I if we were all from the same tribe in the Congo and we all had the same faith and we all had the same subjective perception, if I was dancing to try to invoke the god of fertility, in my mind, I would not be representing the god of fertility. I would not be wearing a mask. I would become the god of fertility. I would fully embody the god of fertility. In the mind of everybody there, you wouldn't say that's Kendall wearing a mask. You'd say that's the god of fertility. Kendall has taken leave of his senses. He's gone somewhere. We don't know where he's gone. He's in limbo somewhere. But that is the god. It's a complete embodiment of the god of fertility. I mean, I think, you know, in, in the Catholic tradition, the, 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 the idea of the wafer being the body of Christ. This is the, the Christian equivalent of where faith can transform an object into an animated something which is beyond its material, physical self. Now you fast forward into the 21st century, no, and sorry, and while I'm dancing the mask, it's going to get my hair, it's going to get my skin, it's going to get scratched, it's going to get dirty. Now we fast forward into the 21st century, the mask that was scratched, made dirty and used and anointed and baptized, that's the mask that's considered authentic, both by the people who made it and the people who collect it. The people who, the, 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 the clean original, excuse me, the clean original brand new mask is considered useless and worthless to anybody. Now this introduces a new understanding of art, which becomes a very interesting one for me because this introduces the idea of art in relation to faith, art in relation to lived experience, art in relation to a society that creates it. It's not an object that one makes for display in a museum. It's an object that one makes to be used, to be embodied, to be animated. Now the interesting thing about these Nkisi figures is that I use them as the example because from the point of view of many people, this is the most authentic African object you can get. This is the most exotic way of thinking about Africa. What they are, in fact, is something quite familiar. <laughs> 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 
What they are, in fact, is some centuries ago, the priests, the missionaries, the Jesuit priests were going through Africa with the story of Jesus and the story of the nails. You see the nails at the bottom. And they were saying that there's this man, Jesus, who died for your suffering. This man, Jesus, died on your behalf, and he was nailed to a cross. So what the animistic people did, the animists in Africa, they interpreted the story. And the cross became the animated object, which is the, they gave it eyes and they gave it a mouth. And each time they wanted to speak to the world of spirit about suffering, each time they wanted to speak about all the things that one would normally associate with the, the crucified Christ, was then embodied in this object. So they would then, they would lick the nails and they would nail, they would like nail it into the wood and each one was a prayer. So in many ways, the, 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 the absolute exotic tribal traditional African object is very similar to the, 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 the crucifix. It just looks different because our perception is subjective. So we have very different interpretations of images that look different but function in the same way. And here's a, um, an image, uh, one of my Kisi figures wrapped in uh, red and white chevron. And another one um, with is the title for my next exhibition, um, Animistic Activist, which will be in South Africa um, in December. Um, and here we have an image with my arm, a bronze, um, it's called St. John's Pendulum. Which brings me to this journey as an artist. And the question that I'm asking myself since a few years now is, what is my nature? Which is something that one might be able to take for granted under some circumstances, but one that I certainly cannot take for granted because, now I showed this image from 1990. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a photograph of me with um, blood on my head and it's called Bloody Hell. And essentially what it represents is me giving birth to myself because I was born into um, apartheid South Africa um, and here you see me in 1985 being arrested you see uh, when I still had hair now um, I was you know, you know the reason why it's a very hot day and the policemen are wearing um, um, shirts um, which was for, for, for the hot day and the rest of us are wearing sweaters is because we knew we were going to jail that night um, and as an anti-apartheid activist, I ended up in exile, I ended up in New York, um, and then when, when Mandela was released, I could go back to South Africa. And the first thing I did when I got back to South Africa is I took the blood out of my arms and I tried to wash myself. Um, okay, and I'm not going to speak too much about that, except that what's important about this is that imagine one day that everything you believe in is illegitimate. Because I was, must have been 21 when I did this. But having grown up in apartheid South Africa, every single thing, my father, my church, my school, my president, the police, every single thing that anybody in authority had ever taught me was wrong. Yeah. Everything. So I had to start again. I had no culture. I had no ancestors that I could think, fall back on. I had no morality. I had no... I had to literally give birth to myself and reset the clock of identity and go about a process of trying to think of a legitimacy that I didn't have, okay? And one of the ways I did that um, was in trying to define myself was trying to look for the same kinds of contradictions that I was as a white South African. So I started to make work with um, this material here, this line here which is a razor mesh. The rest of it is barbed wire because it had a connection to the country that I was born into. So the first time that barbed wire was ever used as a military weapon was in South Africa by the British against the Boers during the Boer War in 1898. That was barbed wire. All right? During the time of apartheid, a company in South Africa invented this one, which is called razor wire. So barbed wire today is for cattle. Razor wires for humans. And still to this day, this company in South Africa has the world patent on razor mesh, which is then exported globally. So I started to work with that material as a, as a metaphor for the complexity and the contradiction of 
what I am, where I'm coming from, something rooted in Africa, but also um, speaking an international language. And I made a lot of the, the interesting thing is, um, so here we have at the bottom uh, an installation I have in Germany called Waiting for the Barbarians. And the top, I mean, whether it's Guantanamo Bay, whether it's Abu Ghraib prison, it's all coming from this company in South Africa. Um, and even when you go to Gare du Nord in Paris and you want to take the Eurostar from Paris to London, it's in the train station. It's not just at border zones um, on the outside, on the outskirts. No, it's actually in the dead center of Paris. And I started to then try to make a lot of sculptures. And already here, my work was starting to turn from away from the idea of politics, away from the political, trying to enter into a spiritual zone. This is a work called House of Spirits, which is um, on permanent display at Castello di Arma, if you ever want to go and um, visit it. Um, so you have, essentially, what you have here is um, my razor mesh inside one of the drawings of the platonic solids drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. And the title is taken from um, Isabel Allende, who was the niece of Salvador Allende, who was uh, assassinated. Um, and here's another, another House of Spirits um, based on another um, um, drawing from, from Leonardo. But already there was, I was starting to enter into this idea of transformations of consciousness, transformations of how I can use art as a way to try to shift ways of seeing coming out of a revolution. So this is also at Castello di Arma, where you see the word revolution backwards and the word love forwards. Because I'm trying to understand at this point this idea of cycles of life and how we come into being and trying to find ways in which artists are able to communicate and define these very complex, contradictory life forces and life processes. And here we see the, 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 the journey from the, the sperm and the egg through to life, which is actually being played out here in, in, the, in the, the flower of life, which is this idea of the intersection of two worlds, the intersections of flesh and spirit. Now, you remember earlier I showed this image of the, um, to illustrate the idea of astrology, looking up to the skies, but the idea of Hermes Trimagistus then plays out because what's happening in Leo and in Taurus and right now we're in, in Mercury retrograde, which is why, you know, if you're feeling a little bit frustrated today, if you're feeling a little bit irritated for the last week, if you don't find your place, it's, don't take it personally. It's not about you. <laughs> Mercury is in retrograde. We're all having a difficult time right now. Everybody is having the same frustrations. Everything is going wrong for everybody. And of course, the, you know, these two intersecting circles of spirit and flesh, inside and outside, uh, heavens and earth, create this beautiful image of the mandorla. So here we have some Zulus um, with their shields, um, with this image of the, the intersecting circles. And here's a, a painting of mine with intersecting circles. And of course, so we, we see here the playing out of in a way, it's, so the two circles intersecting is the idea of the inside and the outside. This is the heavens and the earth. But we're all connected. We're not alone. The complexity of life, the complexity of politics, the complexity of perception plays out. So you start from the, the family. So remember I showed you earlier the cross with a single circle. Well, it gets so much more complex because we are contradictory beings. We are those black and white squares which love and hate at the same time. We hate ourselves and love people, but we hate people and love ourselves. And it plays out in greater and greater complexities as consciousness evolves. And I mean, this particular image, you'll find it in ancient Egypt, you'll find it in ancient China, and here's a drawing of Leonardo da Vinci of the very same image. Which brings me to the talk tonight, the intoxication of being, and more specifically, in the intoxication of being Candle Gears. Now, I came out of a political revolution. My work grew out of a political revolution. But that doesn't work anymore because the politicians don't have as much power as other people have. And I wanted to connect myself with other kinds of revolutions. The revolutions, when I speak about what is my nature, the revolution of the planets, the revolutions of time, the revolutions of the cycles of the seasons, the revolution of the cycles of life, 
and within those revolutions, try to understand the role that an artist can play. It's a, one of the expressions we have in English, I don't know if it's in Italian, is that, you know, the, the, um, they say in English that prostitution is the oldest profession. Well, it's not true. Because long before we had money, and long before we had roads, and businessmen and pimps, somebody was crawling in the back of a cave to make this painting. Art is the oldest profession. Long before, I mean, okay, he has an erection, but apart from that, <laughs> what took possession of this man? Now, the interesting thing about Lascaux is that that image is like deep, deep, deep in one of the recesses. It's not an easy place to paint this image. He went to, whoever painted that went to a lot of effort to create that image. So it must have been meaningful. Now, the thing about this image is that there is this idea that the people who made these images were a little bit stupid. Technically, they have the same genetic that we have. Technically, we have not evolved in 250,000 years. We have the same mental capacity, the same hands that can do the same things. We have everything that our body is was exactly the same 19,000 years ago when they made that. And we just like to assume that he must have been stupid. And the official story goes, well, if they wanted to eat a buffalo, they would draw a buffalo on the wall and then shoot it with a tiny bow and arrow and then go out into the field and try and hunt a buffalo. Now, I don't know who would be that stupid. <laughs> I mean, even if, you're, even if you're living in a cave, you're not going to be that stupid to think that shooting, going to all the effort to crawl into the back of the cave to make a painting of an animal to eat would be so much more easy just to hunt the animal. And the biggest problem with that theory is that the bones that they find in the cave and around the cave are not the bones of the animals they were drawing. So they were not hunting the animals that they were depicting. So that was definitely not the reason why they were um, making those drawings. Now, what I find fascinating, if you pay attention to this image, so here you have a man with a bird face, and he has his staff here with a bird on the staff and another staff over there, which is not unlike Thoth over here with the bird head and his staff, who is actually, the Thoth is the Egyptian version of Hermes Trimagistus. Thoth is the god who gave us writing. Thoth is the god, he's the trickster god. He's the equivalent of Hermes, he's the, and he's the, he's, the, he's the equivalent of Hermes Trimagistus, the thrice great. Now why would we assume that the person in the Lascar cave was necessarily less intelligent than the Egyptians who made this image of Thoth? Here we see him again making the notes um, when we're weighing the, 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 the person's heart in next to a feather. And here's another person who's associated with a, a, a staff and a bird, uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Now, I introduced the idea of the guy in Lascaux with his interaction because this introduces now the more dangerous side of what it is to be human. So he's got all the blood rushing to his penis, and there's this wonderful quote from Robin Williams that says, "A man has only enough blood to be in his a man has only enough blood to be in his penis or his head, but not at the same time." <laughs> and in the intoxication of this guy with his erection, losing sense of consciousness, we start to then generate other symbols. So the alchemical and in India the image of um, the male sex is the upward pointing triangle and the, the lingam of Shiva is um, the, 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 the tantric uh, Hindu equivalent of representing the male sex um, which is quite simply a stone. And of course we know the Venus of Willendorf and the representation of the Earth Goddess or the Earth Mother, which is also represented by the triangle pointing down. And here we see some tantric um, illustrations of the lingam and the, uh, the yoni. And when they come together, we have the Star of David. Now, this is a representation which has nothing to do, I mean, it, it is connected to the Jewish faith in as much as King Solomon was able to use this symbol, the sign, in order to control the jinn and build the Temple of Solomon. Remember we saw it earlier with the black and white squares? But it's so much more complex than that because this is the alchemical symbol, the equivalent of the yin and yang once again. This is the union of male and female forces, male and female energy, the union of creation and destruction. So we see here's another tantric um, in Hindu 
illustration of the same energy forces at work. Um, and an alchemical image from which I, I, I like to take from the Leonard Cohen album, uh, The Union of the Male and Female Forces. Um, and from that image of the triangle, we start to develop the concepts of the four different elements of water, air, um, earth, and um, fire. And in the process, we start to invent hierarchies. So suddenly, the guy is in the cave in Lascar. He's got all the blood pumping into his, his, his penis, and he invents the, the upward pointing triangle. And with that, invents the idea of hierarchy. With that, invents the idea of power. Starts to invent this idea of, and I love the fact that in the word power, the middle three letters say O. Oh. And of course, the problem with power is that you want to be the eye at the top. You want to be the one with all the money. You want to be the one controlling the world simply because you have power, not because you have respect. But I wanted to introduce these two triangles because they introduce something about our consciousness which is dangerous. They introduce, this is not the vertical and the horizontal anymore, which is very simple and something easy for us to grasp. No, this is the introduction of the X factor. I'm sorry, I think I'm getting a cold. Um, so the X becomes dangerous because it introduces the things beyond our control. The vertical and the horizontal, these are things we can believe in. These are things we can farm the fields of. These are things we can pray to. But the X is about our, 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 our mortality. Now you think about the crossbow, the, the, the idea of poison, um, you know, if something is X-rated, that's pretty much the guy in, in Lascaux, I mean X-rated, we use this word X, and in the diagonal, you know, we start to create the sense of danger. I mean, I find it so interesting that wherever you go in the world, danger is a diagonal, it's not a vertical. Whether it's the stops, whether it's the streets, whether it's the diagonals, and of course, power. I mean, so I use this great, uh, you know, the Victoria Police, you know, the military also uses the diagonal as an illustration of power. X is also the idea of buried treasure. I like this cute little map because it also has the skull and crossbones over there. The idea of democracy, another X. You know, when you go and vote, so here's the, here's the image from the first South African election in 1994 where we went to vote. And um, this was a performance that I made in 1993 where I joined every single political party in South Africa. It almost cost me my life. Um, where am I going from here? Yeah, all right. But I needed to take that X, that danger zone, and transform it into another form of revolution. Take that danger zone from simply being the political idea of danger, the political idea of the um, razor mesh, and transform it into something more than just the violence, into something shamanic, into something symbolic. And I started to observe, and I started to look around at representations from around the world of how artists have embraced the idea of consciousness. So this is a, a work of art that is 60,000 years old. It's the earliest known work of art. This is like 40,000 years before Lascaux. It's from the Blombos Cave in South Africa. And you, ha you see the cross hatchings, the X. Here we have the, 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 white, the, 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 it's the white lady from um, the, an early Aboriginal painting. Um, there in the center, you see in the center of the, the, the masks, the, the diagonal. And you start to see this particular idea of the cross hatch playing out in so many forms of faith around the world, so many cultural icons built on this idea of the danger zone, the idea of um, altered states of consciousness being represented by this, the diagonal, different than the vertical and horizontal. And this is the kind of model of the artist that I wanted to think about, which is about other ways of seeing. The artist who is able to say, like the child, that the emperor has no clothes on. The artist has the freedom 
to say the things today that nobody else can say, that the politicians cannot say, that the pop stars cannot say, that the, that the, the Hollywood cannot say. But it's not just ways of seeing, it's other ways of being. One has to enter into these states of consciousness. And here, what's so interesting is the Harlequin. You will notice that the, the Harlequin clothing is again the X. It's not the chessboard, it's the checkerboard, it's the vertical, the danger zone of the diagonal that plays out with the Harlequin. And we start to talk about the idea of the clown and the trickster. So here we have the coyote trickster from the Native Americans. The trickster who is, again, Hermes Trimagistus. The trickster who's, you know, the god Hermes who was able to make his brother's um, cattle walk backwards out of the cave in order to steal them. Now other ways of being, what I'm talking about here is ways of entering into other states of consciousness. And I was very inspired by, so there you see some of the rock art from, uh, from South Africa, from the, the Bushmen. Um, and I, have, I had the good fortune as a young impressionable person to study under a man called David Lewis Williams. And I did some primary research in the, in the rock art paintings. And David Lewis Williams was radical in his theory because he was one of the first people to propose the idea of sympathetic magic for Lasker or for any of the rock art is absolute nonsense. Because what sympathetic magic doesn't explain is the anomalies of representation. It doesn't explain why they could draw perfectly well certain human figures, and then they decided not to. And it doesn't explain these abstractions like the lions over there, you know, jumping up. And what, the, and what happened was, um, by coincidence, there was German anthropologists, um, I think they were actually missionaries, in South Africa in the late 18th century, and they documented the Bushman prisoners Bushman prisoners, the things that they were saying. And these books just sat for a hundred, more than a hundred years. Nobody read them until David Lewis Williams came along and he said, wait, wait a minute, why don't we take what, his name was Bleak, what Bleak had written about what the Bushmen were doing and then pair it off with the paintings. And started to realize that so these things that you see there, they were called thinking strings. And what they were was the Bushmen would dance themselves into exhaustion and in the dancing enter into altered states of consciousness. And these were the thinking strings that then they would enter the consciousness of animal spirits. And they would be able to connect to the divine through these so-called thinking strings. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, one of the uh, signs when you enter into a deep state of trance is the spontaneous nosebleed. And here we, here we have an image of Joseph Boyce. It's not bleeding, not bleeding yet. <laughs> and David Lewis Williams then, um, he, he called this, he, he, he started to make an analysis of what he called entoptic phenomena, which, you know, the, the, the different kinds of art and the, the comparing representation and abstraction and then working with psychologists and trying to then understand that in fact a lot of the abstractions that we are seeing um, with the, shaman the shamanic process are things that people really do see. And you see these, so the zigzag that I'm talking about, and you see it throughout art history, certain images reoccurring like the circles of the circle, the, 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 tr the flower of uh, life that you see me working with there, like the nails, um, certain things reoccurring. And you start to realize that maybe that artists are these tricksters that are able to enter into other states of consciousness to bring into these three dimensions communication from the divine. And there are a number of ways that, you know, the Bushmen would dance themselves into trance just through exhaustion. They would literally dance for 24 hours. Um, here we see Brian Geisen and William Burroughs with the dream machine, which is literally using strobing as a flickering. Um, I like to use this image of Salome as another representation of dancing into altered states of consciousness. And of course, we have the, the traditional shamanic way is with the drum beat. Um, we have meditation, and of course we can use uh, mushrooms or, or ayahuasca or anything, other forms of plants, and of course prayer is another way of doing it. Um, and the f what's interesting, so here we have a work of mine and here we have another self-portrait of mine. Um, the flicker of the flame 
a single candle, that's the exact strobe frequency needed to induce altered states of consciousness. So we go back to the guy in Lascaux, going into the back of the cave. Now remember, he, he or she would have need a flame to get to the back because they didn't have torches. So they would have been hallucinating. Now imagine going to the back of a cave 19,000 years ago with a flame and the shadows are dancing. Of course you're going to enter into an altered state of consciousness. And of course our friend Bacchus, um, who is, you know, and again, my, um, I will go back to Castello di Arma as a great example of wine and alcohol is another way of generating altered states of consciousness. Um, and of course, those of you who know me, you know, um, know very well the, the broken bottle, um, which was me thinking about the idea of entering into the world of spirit, into an altered state of consciousness. So the broken bottle coming from South Africa, but saying imported from Holland, is also speaking about spirit. And there's this wonderful quote here that I just want to read to you from um, Alistair Crowley, who was one of the great magicians of the 20th century. And he wrote, um, he's speaking about somebody. He says, I suppose, in fact, that one wouldn't get much result by giving heroin and cocaine, however cunningly mixed to the average man. You can't get a thing, you can't get out of a thing what isn't there. In 99 cases out of 100, any stimulant of whatever nature operates by destroying temporarily the inhibitions of education. The ordinary drunken man loses the veneer of civilization. But if you give it to the right man, the administration of a drug is quite likely to suppress his mental facilities with the result that his genius is set free. <laughs> what Crowley is stating quite clearly is not everybody is able to be an artist. Not everybody is able to enter into the dark side of losing the veneer of education in order to drag out. And here we talk about the trickster, the artist as trickster, the artist as drunk, but in their inebriation, finding the diamonds, the gems of other ways of seeing in order to speak the truths about the naked emperor. I mean, the idea of art was so important to Crowley that he took the, 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 the 14th card of the tarot, which was normally called temperance, and he changed the name to art. And here you see again the visitor in, uh, visitor in terra rectificando. In the, I, I, my Latin is terrible. <laughs> but again, so he has the mantra of the alchemists around the card of art, this idea of the, the simultaneous, so we have the male and female, the mixing together of contradictions in order to forge another state of consciousness. Now it's important that the, 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 the stone that you have to find, it's a stone, which means it's natural, but it's within. You have to go inside to find your nature. Okay, so here we have that point in the night where if you want to leave, <laughs> Control, Alt, Delete. Let's start again. Let's reset. Because Koyani Skatsi, the world is topsy-turvy. Koyani Skatsi is the Hopi Indian world word for nature out of balance. We have reached a point where the world that I was born into no longer exists. And I would say that's the same. That's true, I think, of every single one of you except Gemma, Vladka, and Isidore. But everyone else here the world that you were born into no longer exists. And this world that you're living in now is on the precipice of meltdown. We have overstayed our welcome as a species. We've, we've overstayed our welcome as cultures. We've driven this planet. We are driving this planet to extinction. Um, here's a, so these are the images the, from the, the, the animals from the Gulf of Mexico that were kind of... Uh, drowning in the oil slick and then these are sculptures are made called Fla Flesh of the Spirits which was me trying to uh, they're made in resin so it's a byproduct of oil me trying to give an image to the spirit of oil it's more than a demon than a spirit me trying to give a face to the ugly demons of, 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 of the oil industry and as an artist I feel poisoned by the idea of consumerism poisoned by the fact that artists just assume we're all idiots. They just assume we're stupid by telling us banalities and selling those banalities for millions. 
Um, I want to propose the idea of the artist as shaman and the, artia, uh, the artist as trickster. Because it is my belief, thinking about Hermes Trimagistus, as above, so below, outside and inside, that we are little more than transmitter receivers. Our bodies are connected to the divine through those thinking strings. We just don't know how to activate them anymore. Picabia made this beautiful painting, which I have been obsessing. Picabia is an artist that I obsess with. Um, and he made this beautiful painting called Le Double Monde, The Double World, with this kind of figure eight, this idea of, the, of infinity. Um, and what he's proposing, I believe, is this idea of the inside and the outside world, this idea of the above and below, which is actually not, in my opinion, a new concept. It's just one that we've forgotten. Because when Botticelli made The Birth of Venus, Botticelli wasn't going to the supermarket to buy his paints. Botticelli was making his paints. And when the artists of this generation, of this time, were making their paints, they went to the same place that the doctors would go, that the scientists would go, the alchemists would go, and they were buying the same pigments. I mean, that's what I love about Sienna. I mean, we have a pigment called Sienna because it was coming from this, this was the color of the earth in the city. Other pigments you need to crush uh, carnivorous uh, snails to get. And in order to get the green of the sea of Botticelli, he would literally take copper and rust the copper so to get something called verdigris. And so when he made the birth of Venus painting, so in alchemy, Venus is represented by copper. And copper rusts green. And that's why Venus is the goddess of earth and nature. And Botticelli would have been very aware of that. So when he was making a representation of, Botticelli, of, the, of Venus, he was literally painting Venus with the material of Venus. So he was fully embodying the inside and the outside through the pigment as well as through the image. And of course, you know, the, we go back to, to the, the broken bottle. Um, now what I find fascinating about Heineken's, you see the, the pentagram there, and I, I'm just going to make a slight detour here to talk about Venus for a second because she, it's quite amazing that every eight years, now you remember the eight from the, from the, the um, Bacabia painting, every eight years Ma, um, um, Venus, the planet, does this image in the sky. Venus makes a perfect pentagram in the sky from the point of view of Earth which is why Venus is very often represented by a pentagram. And the pentagram, of course, has some of these divine laws built into it. Divine geometry, the divine um, the, 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 the ratio, the divine ratio that you see in spirals of shells, basically all over nature is being played out by the same goddess that we use to represent Venus is actually in the sky doing the same shape. And of course the idea of Venus is the idea of protection. We would be protected by Mother Nature. We would want to be protected by Venus. Um, so this is an image with police patterns that I made. Um, and we're haunted by the pentagram throughout history. I mean, there's Dushan, there's his girlfriend, um, Maya Deren, uh, Marina Abramovich. And of course, protection goes all the way to the way we would, def we would build our castles and fortresses. And of course, it's not coincidence that you know, the, the Pentagon is the symbol of American protection, which is the embodiment of the symbol of Venus. Now the thing that I'm a bit confused about in terms of how these things work is I see playing out around me parallels in terms of symbols and how they work, whether it's the cross, whether it's the pentagram, whether it's the hexagram, whether it's the square, whether it's the circle, whether it's the triangle, the Star of David, I'm fascinated to see the consistency with which these things work. In ancient Egypt, the pentagram represented protection, and today, on the police cars, it says to serve and protect around a pentagram. Now, I am confused about whether we find symbols to define our perception or the other way around. And I always use the image of, so here we see the, the hippopotamus here, which is the god Set. And on top of him, you have um, 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 Horus, who eventually kills Set. Now, Set was represented by the hippopotamus. Now, the one thing that you know coming from Africa 
is that more humans, and I've, uh, this is a wonderful piece of nonsense floating around Facebook, um, and it's actually about trying to protect sharks, saying that sharks are not that dangerous because sharks only kill five people annually. 40 people are killed by jellyfish, 130 people by deer, cows kill 22 people annually. But hippopotami kill 2,900 people annually. The hippopotamus is the most dangerous killer, or the, the hippopotami kill more humans than any other animal except for the, for the malaria mosquito. Now if you imagine the River Nile and you imagine the Egyptians and their relationship to the hippopotamus, it's quite normal that the god of chaos, and so Set is the equivalent of Lucifer or the devil that in the Christian symbolism, and they give that name to Set. Now Set is very much the god of chaos and destruction and disorder. And it's quite normal that they would then embody this god as the hippopotamus. But did they invent the hippopotamus to represent Set, or did they invent <laughs> Set to represent the hippopotamus? And again, we, we have this journey where we start off with our fears. And I don't know if we start with our fears to construct things or whether our fears come afterwards. But from our fear, from scared, we invent our faith. So we're afraid of the hippopotamus, and then we invent the idea of set to embody and explain the chaos that the hippopotamus brings. And then, unfortunately, we forget all about our, f our faith, and today we just turn it into a profit and we just make, we go back to the triangle with the money in, um, and we sort of create faith out of money and power out of money once again. Um, and there's a neon of mine that's the word sacred and the word scared, which is just the two letters um, changing. Now, on a molecular level, so this is the image we have of the atom. Now, we don't have much problems comparing the idea of the atom with the solar system. It's essentially the same thing, that we have the sun and around it we have the planets, and at the atomic level we have the atom and then the protons and the neutrons around it. Now this might be on a physical level, three-dimensional level, the idea of the outside and the inside, but I have no doubt that the idea of our mythologies, our stories, whether it be the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, even the Bible, even the, the, the Rig Vedas, these are the external manifestations of everything that is inside us. That actually it starts on the inside and then it's projected out. That's actually starting within that our perception is not only subjective, but our perception is constructing the way the world is and what the world is. Um, so just uh, very quickly, I want to just show you a couple of drawings I made. So based on this drawing of Sol Lewitt, so remember I told you that I became fascinated by Sol Lewitt's uh, motto that perception is subjective. So I took this wall drawing of Sol Lewitt and from that derived these um, drawings that I make with rust um, called Age of Iron. And the reason why I'm just showing you this very quickly is because in the idea of Botticelli was painting his birth of Venus because copper rusts green. So Mars or Aries, the god of war, rusts red because red is the color of blood. So the consequence of the god of war. So these are drawings made literally with rust. So I, pay, I, I, I put iron down on the paper and then I rust it um, to get these uh, blood colors. Um, okay. So how do I find that stone inside me? How do I find that gem, that piece of earth that is inside me that I need to correct? And one of the ways, so one of the things that the Nkisi figures um, have in common is that you see in the image over there, but you see it here very clearly, is that very often for the eyes and for the stomach, they would have a mirror. Because the mirror for them represented this idea of the entry into the world of spirit. The mirror was the way to speak to the ancestors. It was the way to speak to the demons. It was the way to communicate with their divine space which is not a uniquely African process because, I mean, and, you know, we, we, we know from Walt Disney, mirror, mirror on the wall, but actually, you know, the, the looking glass in the mirror was very much part of Western consciousness at some point. We just lost control of that. And the mirror then became something that I started to work with in my work because the mirror literally is this idea of above and below when you're standing on the mirror. 
and it's the idea of looking into a space. But it becomes a very interesting metaphor for the, the, the shift of consciousness that has taken place between certain parts of the world and other parts of the world. So in Africa, South America, Asia, where the mirror stands for the entry to the world of spirit, in Europe and the United States and the developed world where we've gone from sacred to credit, the mirror represents self-hatred. When you look in the mirror, you hate everything that you see because you've been taught that you are incomplete. You've been taught that everything from the color of your skin to the color of your hair to your weight to every single thing about you to the way you smell is wrong. And then you have to then reach behind the mirror and pull out the Viagra or the aspirin or the deodorant, or absolutely everything in order to correct what's not wrong with you. So the mirror became a space that I was very interested in. So here we, it's, a, it's um, a performance that I made where you have two people, a man and a woman, struggling to keep this mirror vertical. And in the process, you create the, the androgen between the male and the female, because you see the top half of the one and the bottom half of the other. Um, and I started to use the mirror in my installations um, so this was uh, called post-punk pagan pop, which is a labyrinth made of uh, the razor mesh. Um, and this brings me closer to where I'm at now. Um, this, is a, this is one called Monument to the F Word, and there are two monuments to the F Word. One points up, it's carved bronze, and the other one points down, which is carved stainless steel, a pendulum. And they very much, they, they were a homage to um, Brancusi's bird in flight. But also the idea of the F word, um, the, the idea of Foucault's pendulum, another F word, Foucault, um, because you would be able to read the gravitational force of the Earth as the pendulum is moving very, very slowly, imperceptibly. But if you, if you mapped out where the pendulum is placed over a period of time, you would see the turning of the Earth. So gravity being a force of nature. And of course, other F words is so when, you know, flight is very clearly something that the, the modern world is based on. And the ability to send rockets into pl in the Isidore. Can you come down? The ability to send rockets and airplanes across the planet has, of course, those forms of flight have sent people into flight the displacement of people as refugees. So the whole world today is on meltdown, partly because we have airplanes that can bring you Kiwis from, um, from New Zealand in 24 hours and the whole consequence of what is going on in the world. But w as an artist, I want to return to a more natural way of being, finding my nature. So the idea of tracking the, the, the idea of the F word is the, the, literally the birds in flight, reconnecting myself with natural forms. And how, I want, how I'm trying to do that is this idea of spiritualizing matter and materializing spirit. This idea of bringing together the inside and the outside of the two worlds of, um, of, of Picabia, which is, of course, I mean, that image of Picabia is none other than the representation of time, space, and black holes. And also, um, here we have a, an, an, a 400 year old Indian representation of nature and of the construction of reality, which is exactly the same image of these two mirror worlds the, in, the inner world and the outer world coexisting. Now, I'm going to take a departure here and talk again about Picabia in this idea of the two worlds. So, what you're looking at there is a, the, the one on the right is a very classic Picabia illustration or drawing called La Sainte Vierge, the Holy Virgin. And it has been interpreted, he made two versions. There's that version, here's the second version. Um, and he's made this, it has been interpreted as classic Dada provocation. Heretical, um, anti the Virgin Mary, tri sacrilege. It has been interpreted as Dada nonsense. Now, I don't think it's unimportant that he decided to make this particular collage here of his drawing and juxtapose it with the Holy Virgin of Ang because I don't see anything in this juxtaposition that is suggesting that it's heresy or sacrilege. He's simply putting these two together and I would like to try to think about why or what it could be. So 
here we see on the left the last time version of Picabi, and on the right, Hans up made more or less at the same time, squares composed according to the laws of chance. Here we see it. Now what's interesting is that in 1917, in the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, when Hans Arp made this image, um, and it, again, it's been interpreted as classic Dada nonsense. Just take a bunch of squares and throw them down on the table. Meaningless, arbitrary, random, anti-aesthetic, anti-art. At the same time he made this collage, in the Cabaret Voltaire, he, he read out as a performance Aurora from Jacob Böhm. Exactly the same time. Now, this will tell you straight that Arp was familiar with Jacob Böhm. Now, Jacob Böhm is one of the great Christian alchemists of his time. And from an alchemical point of view, there is no such thing as chance. Because if the inside and the outside is the same thing, is the, uh, if the above and below are connected, then when you throw the cards, whether it be the tarot cards, or whether you put the I Ching, or whether you put the, the tea leaves or the coffee grinds, my favorite in Istanbul is when they, they melt lead and throw lead into water, that in the eyes of a psychic, the splash of ink or the tarot cards is destiny. And the only thing that stops you from understanding what the reading is, is your perception or your ability to read. And what happens if what Picabia was talking about, La San Vierge, is Mother Nature? Because when you throw the ink down, it composes itself according to chance, but chance is destiny. What happens if what Picabia was actually doing was not being sacrilege, but embodying the idea of the Virgin Mary from a different point of view? What happens if he was maybe proposing something like a black Madonna, which is not heretical or sacrilege. There are many churches which have black Madonnas. They're not exactly heretical. Or I always love this image of uh, Saint Bernard with uh, the Virgin Mary with the milk flying into his face. Now, nothing sacrilege or heretical about that image. And what if Picabia was really trying to embody in a shamanic way the idea of channeling consciousness, channeling the Virgin Mary as the ink, landing on the paper with respect to nature. And of course I got into a lot of trouble um, with uh, my drawings, these drawings, which um, are called La San Vierge in homage to Picabia and everybody kind of got it completely wrong and misunderstood uh, what they were about so I stopped making them. Um, And then it was time for me to really take a leap of faith and try to embody my process, to, to try to think about ways that artists have worked before in this process of making physical, materializing spirit and spiritualizing matter. And I'm just going to talk about a few here which helped me illustrate my points. Of course, there's Yves Klein where he was literally having people's body make the impressions which then created the... Um, the, the, the marks on the, on the paintings. But my favorite for the moment is Jackson Pollock. And Pollock because it's very well known, his drip paintings. And it's an artist who, when I think about, I really want to hate. But each time I stand in front of a Pollock, I'm mesmerized. When you stand in front of those paintings, they have a magic and they have a strength and they have an energy that nobody else has been able to parallel. What is it that made Pollock able to drip paint and no, I mean he's had thousands of people try to copy him, maybe hundreds of thousands, but nobody succeeds. What's the difference? And the key is you have to go back to the early paintings of Pollock and understand that Pollock was deeply influenced by the Native Americans, deeply influenced by the shamanic paintings of the Navajo Indians. Here we see the Navajo Indians making a sand painting that Jackson Pollock actually under his bed had every issue of the Native American Studies Journal and he was attending their rituals and he was trying to follow their, their ways of working and I believe that he went on that process and that his painting was actually a channeling of spirit. Um, and here's another beautiful image from uh, Italian artist Alighiero Boetti called Shoman Shaman. Um, all right. And it's from there that I entered into the world of painting and took the political sign of the contradiction 
of my birth, the contradiction of being a white African. And I laid canvas out on the floor of my studio and entered into the process of chaos. So not unlike the, the La Sainte Vierge drawings, but I went a step further in the idea of trying to materialize spirit, spiritualize matter by turning off the rational parts of my brain in order to embody the process of making art. So in my studio, I roll out the canvas on the floor and then, like Eve Klein, I'm throwing my body into the paint. I'm using my body as gesture, I'm using my body to make marks, I'm using my body to try to generate energy which manifests as whether it be splashes or lines or whatever and then overlay on that, not unlike the mural over here, these, these, these divine archetypal universal signs of consciousness and then try to find this layering between what one can perceive and what one cannot perceive. The layering between what you can control and what you can't control, between creation and destruction. The idea of channeling consciousness. And of course, in this process, I'm searching for archetypes that are known to me. The idea of the tarot card not being chance but being destiny. And of course, the tarot card is built up of certain images which go back to that story I told you, which starts as a dot and go through a line, to a cross, to a circle, to a spiral. Um, and of course, these images are, here's another one from the Duomo. I mean, these kinds of archetypes are hundreds of years old, and they're so deeply embedded in our consciousness that, like the hippopotamus of Set, I don't know if we created these images, if these images created us. But nonetheless, I try to construct art now as portals into consciousness, portals into other ways of being, in my process of creating, so that I may invite you as the viewer into other ways of seeing. So this image, of course, reminds me of the um, Oculus Witness of Duchamp, and so a few more images based on the Picabia um, paintings. And uh, w there's, a, there's a, a neon over there, which is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's El, no, it's not El Greco. El Greco, and here we have Velazquez. So taking these images from art history and literally wrestling with language, wrestling with history, wrestling with inheritance of an artist, whether it's Velazquez or whether it's um, Rubens or Goya, whether it's Jackson Pollock or Eve Klein as an artist, I have to wrestle with these histories like Hermes Trimagistus in the Duomo in order to somehow pull out of it images that are relevant for today where I can try to, as an artist, say the emperor has no clothes and speak again of the questions of spirit. That art has the capacity to speak beyond the material, to take us into worlds of the looking glass of Alice in Wonderland, take us through consciousness into the world of imagination revitalize the experience of being alive in the world today. That's my uh, sacre coeur and my homage to uh, Sienna. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have any questions. And I would like to say thank you to my children, Isito and Vladka, who were so well behaved. Do you want to say hello? Mm. Hello. Are there any questions? Was that too much? Was that too little? So, I am, I mean, of course I was thinking about Siena and the history here, and I'm very fascinated by the, the, the Sienese painters. Um, I didn't show you any of the images, but I have been doing work trying to work with <coughs> Duccio and, 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 and um, Giotto, and I mean all of them, I mean trying to wrestle with those. and. Knowing that I was coming to do this talk here, I also wanted to find a key which could 
speak for where I'm at now, but also where I'm going to, but also where I'm coming from. And I thought that, I mean, I'm increasingly fascinated by the idea of the Inkisi figure, the fetish figure, as an African symbol, which is in contradictory actually a crucifix symbol. And then pairing it off with these, these, these geometric patterns which have transformed from being my prison of identity, the razor mesh, which is the prison of my identity, which takes me back to the apartheid past, but now I'm using them as liberating symbols. So I'm trying to liberate my, my, my self-identity through the, the divine geometry of the razor mesh and then throw into that the, the super, what you would call superstition, but the animism of the fetish. And then somehow pull this apart into something which makes sense because the, the nails from the Jesuits make sense in terms of the nails in the Nkisi figures. Um, which makes sense in terms of the steel borders that we're constructing our worlds with, but in this way transforming them into a sign of hope rather than a sign of fear. So the figure is standing up there and he becomes a symbol of victory rather than a symbol of defeat. Um, that instead of being prisoner of that fence, he's breaking out in this, this burst of, of, of um, energy which is shattering the fences. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it's, you know, the interesting thing about speaking about art is I can speak about work in the past because I've had the time to digest it and I've had the time to process it. And I, I don't know if you, you, you probably would have picked it up, but what I'm trying to explain is the way of working for me is a channeling in, in the sense that if it's a pure channeling, it's not about me going into the studio or saying, today I want to do this and this and this. It's a case of me going into the studio and trusting that my, you can call it the unconscious, you can call it spiritual, you can, you can give it any name you want, and I don't want to name it, but trusting that this is going to come through me and things are going to happen. That I'm not always, no, that I am always not conscious of. That the process of creation is not a conscious process. It's a process of, I think of the artist as a midwife bringing these things into the world, but I don't know who the mother and the father is. I'm just wrestling with them. And then they come into the world. And in the moment of them coming into the world, I don't understand what they are. But I have to trust the process and trust myself and trust that whatever is happening is happening for the right reasons. And then as time passes, when I look back, I can go, oh, that's what it was about. So it's very difficult for me to speak about this because it's brand new. I can speak about the foiled works because, you know, they're in those works. I mean, what, what you see here is literally it's the same th stuff. Now, you understand I'm interested in alchemy, and one of the m alchemical metals is tin. Okay? Now, tin is fascinating because this is the thing that we wrap our sandwiches in. This is the, for me, in a way, one of the symbols of throwaway culture. You go to school, your sandwich is wrapped in tin foil, you unwrap it, you eat your sandwich, and you throw away the tin. But it is a metal, which means it's not going to disintegrate, it's not biodegradable, it's going to be there forever. And I wanted to know if I could take something so mundane and banal as tin and spiritualize it. So it's the idea then of taking these, and then Brussels has these... Um, I live in Brussels, and they have these <coughs> antique shops. And they have these amazing crucifixes and Buddhas and objects that once upon a time were sacred and people would venerate or worship. And they end up in the flea market because they've lost their energy or they've lost their use. And what I want to do by, it's a bit like when I wrap the crucifix, when you take something away, you know, absence makes the heart more grow fonder. So by taking away the object, I want to see, can I find a way of capturing the spirit of a lost object into the impression of the tin? So you take something so incredibly fragile, and then, I mean, and these works are fragile. If you took them out of the frame and you put your finger, they just disintegrate. So to make something of the spirit permanent, transferring from a once sacred object. Much. Um, I try to be very as 
successfully attempted through your race a few centuries, religion, your philosophy. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. My question would be about African art. Uh, as it well known, African art has influenced artists at the beginning of the last century, just to mention two names, Picasso and Modigliani. You also uh, said, I think, that uh, African art has influenced your art. Uh, what is the difference between the influence uh, African art had, had on the artists of the last century and uh, uh, your art today? Yeah, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself. But there's a beautiful quote of Picasso where he was asked, why do you have these African objects in your studio? Yeah. And Picasso said, because they are alive with energy. Okay? Now, my interest in African objects, apart from the fact that I come from Africa, is that they're alive with energy. When I look at, now, I, I, and I mean, of course you have fake African objects as you have fake Western objects. But when you go and you look at traditional arts from Africa, the object, you feel the spirit. It makes you nervous. It makes you, you feel something is happening there. You feel alive. You, you love it. You hate it. You get scared. You have a reaction to it, which I don't have when I go into contemporary art galleries, which I don't have when I go into most contemporary art museums. I have it when I go to the museum in Siena. I have it when I go to historical museums, because artists did, once upon a time, work with energy and sacred spiritual space. African artists still do. So I'm absolutely not interested in what, uh, and I think that the misinterpretation of Picasso is that he was interested in the image of African art. It's not about the image, it's not about what the mask looked like. It's about what the, uh, what the mask embodied. And in that way, I, I mean, it's, I'm definitely, I think, taking the same kind of connection to African art that Picasso was taking? Um, I thought that uh, you have been more influenced about what has been uh, philosophy, religion, mathematics of the last 3,000 years than more than by African art. Well, you see, it's like this. As an African born in Africa and believing in the animistic logic, this, the African spirits suggested that I need to search out my ancestors. My ancestors are European. <laughs> so there is that contradiction because I am simultaneously African and European. And it is that contradiction that I try to work with, that I take as much from the Western tradition as I take from the African tradition. I mean, I could have I given a lecture tonight about voodoo, but I would probably have terrified everybody and made myself extremely unpopular. And I'm actually trying to do the opposite these days and try to make myself a little bit more accessible. <laughs> so I decided rather to speak about the Western tradition because I was speaking to a Western audience and... You'd probably be terrified. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, I have been in uh, your country, the town, and I bought some uh, art from the township. What, what do you think about Taoshiba? It's made for tourists like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say more than that. It's tourist art.
Okay, so your, the question is, what do I think about Magician de la Terre? Um, let me say that um, there was an exhibition was a few years ago called Maître de... Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm speaking about I'm speaking about another exhibition. There was an exhibition a couple of years ago called Maître des Désordres. Um, I don't know how you say it correctly in French. The Maître des Désordres was like two years ago, three years ago, and it was at the um, Quai Branly Museum, curated by um, um, what's the guy from Palais Tokyo? Something. Uh, uh, what's the guy from Palais Tokyo? What's his name? Deloisy, Jean Deloisy. Now, Maître des Désordres was a marvelous exhibition because he was putting fetish figures next to images of Dionysus, next to images of Bacchus, next to Thomas Hirshhorn. And what he was proposing in this exhibition was an even playing field between Western artists, non-Western artists, on this idea of the artist as a shaman on the, uh, on the idea of there was nothing pejorative in terms of the juxtaposition. He was assuming that what, John Abib, what, what um, Thomas Hirschhorn was doing was in the same logic as um, an artist from Africa or somewhere else. However, Magician de la Terre for me was hugely offensive and racist. It's racist, and I've had this discussion with Jean Abbé Martin, because it was an unequal pairing. He was taking Western avant-garde artists who were interested in aesthetics and market and juxtaposing them with people who, do, who don't even know what art is. And he was juxtaposing avant-garde works with um, not shamanic work, but more with the tourist stuff. There was some shamanic work there, but it was mostly tourist art that he was proposing and handicrafts. And I always said, if Jean Hebert Matin would juxtapose Lederhosen from Munich next to um, township art, we talk in the same language. But it is patronizing to try to suggest that you're taking people whose intentions are so radically different. Like Esther Mashlangu, the, the, the artist from South Africa, the Bailey, she makes art for tourists. You cannot compare her work with Sol Lewitt. It's completely different, it's different worlds, different dynamics, different intentions, different meanings, different ways of using art, different ways of creating. And what happened in that project as well is that Western art was put on a certain level and valorized, and non-Western art was unvalorized. So following that exhibition, the collection of Jean Pigotzi started together with jean Pierre Martin and uh, André Magnard. And they said, quote, unquote, artists from Africa should not be trained because any training will destroy their natural talent. Man, that's racism. That's colonialism. To say that people from Africa need to be uneducated in order to make art. <laughs> Sure, but I mean, the thing is, you have outsider artists in Europe as well. No. You know, you have outsider artists in Africa and you have outsider artists in Europe. If Jean Hebert Matin was exhibiting European outsiders alongside African outsiders, I would say fine. But to put outsider art from Africa because it looks exotic next to avant garde, it doesn't make any sense. That's my opinion on, on Magician de la Terre. Is there any other questions? Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>